um, of, uh, of, excuse me one second. Okay. Sorry. The very simple, the pshat is a very simple story. Okay, start over. There are four levels to the learning of the Torah. The very first level of learning of the Torah is the pshat level, which is the simple narrative of the story. There was a people, there are, is a people, the Jewish people, and we come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and our ancestors were slaves in Egypt, etc. And we read about that in the Pshat level of the Torah. Then the next level of the Torah, <clears throat> the next level of the Torah is the Remez level. And the Remez level of the Torah is the Torah alludes to, the Torah gives us lessons. The word Torah means lesson. And the Torah often gives us, it's always giving us lesson, not just straight up, but also through some, something called remez, it alludes to, it's a hint, it hints to. And then the next level um, is the uh, is the level of, of drush, which means homeoletic. Homeoletic is with the medrash, if you're familiar with that, you can look it up online. Uh, so much of it is translated online, so you know it's possible to see it there. But either way, the um, the the next level of the Torah is the sod, and sod literally means either secret or foundation, and they're both true, because the sod level of the Torah, which is also the teachings of the Ariza, we're learning, is the esoteric. It's that which is behind the scenes. So just like when we look at the physical body, we have these four levels too. The first level of that which we observe with our eyes would be the shot level, the simple interpretation. And then there's the emotion of a person. That would be the next. There's the intelligence of a person. And then there's the very will of a person. So what we see is only the shot level. We only see. And then the other parts we could learn about, we could become familiar with. But it's not the, you know. Having said that, um, we're going into the teachings of the Arizal. I want to say that today's class is in memory of my very dear friend, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchak ben Rabnesha Schwartz, uh, a.k.a. Schwartzy. Today's his yard site, and uh, he, was, he was very, very kind to me since the time that I was a child, and, and uh, he really was a great teacher to me, and he taught me how to laugh, so in a good way, and how to pray also which was a longer conversation. And also today's a yard site of Yisrael ben Noyach, Errol Ginsberg, who a year ago, unfortunately, a young age passed away. And Errol's been, a, together with his family, have been friends and supporters of Chabad of Malibu, And we miss him dearly. I was by his, uh, by his site today. So wishing his neshama to have a, uh, an aliyah, to have an ascent. Speaking of souls, that's what our conversation is about today. So strap up and let's take into the Arizal. The actual words of the Torah portion is right here what I'm highlighting. It says, When Pharaoh um, sent the nation. Okay, so that's the actual words of the beginning of the Torah in terms of Pharaoh sending away the Jewish people from Egypt. So now this is the words of Rabbi Chaim Vital, who records the teachings of the Ariza. The following is a pleasing mystical interpretation of the exodus from Egypt, a.k.a. Mitzrayim, as an allusion to the departure of the soul from the body at death. All right, so here we go. And remember, this is the unusual way of how usual people learn the Torah because usually just learn the translation. We're deeping, we're going into the deep end, okay? When Pharaoh sent the Jewish people forth, says the Arizo, this refers to when the soul departs the body, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is the neck for the body is stubborn. Stubbornness rules over the body, which is Egypt. Wow. The next part is the interpretation that's, from the author of the book, Rabbi Moshe Wisniewski, who lives in Israel and is an incredible teacher, and I'm grateful for that. The Hebrew word for Pharaoh, Pei Reish Ayin Hei, is composed of the same letters as the word for the neck, Ha'oref, 
which is hey, ayin resh pei. As we have explained previously, the idiom for stubborn in Hebrew is stiff-necked. The body may be described as stubborn since it insists on imposing its gross material perspective on the soul. Egypt, which is Mitzrayim, means constrictions. Mitzarim, an apt term for the body, since it limits the powers of the neshama, of the soul, to those of this world, forcing it to conceive of everything in terms of time and space. Let that sink in. So the actual soul that each of us have has lofty desires. Its ultimate desire is to be in alignment and connection with its purpose and mission. And in being able to do that, it wants to be connecting to the higher self of who we are all the time. How do we do that? When we overcome that which restricts, restricts us from being selfless, etc. Now, the soul's desire is what the soul's desire is, but the nature that Hashem made this world with and the way that we occur, therefore, in the bodies that we do, it has an energy to it that is synonymous with being enslaved in Mitzrayim. The neshama, our neshama, because of the powers in which it is vested in order for it to be present in the physical world, which is called the animalistic part of who we are, that's the Mitzrayim, the body, that limits the real true desire of every one of our souls that really wants to go and you know, be bright like fire, but that is what provides the struggle. So now the Torah says when it comes to Pharaoh, so in this context, Pharaoh is representing the negative consciousness within us that limits us from being able to be present with the soul within us, its potential. Think about that. I mean, how many people that they don't find their greatness and how they could serve the world till a later time in life. Some people never do. The Torah goes on to say, and we're back to the words of the Arizal. God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. When the soul leaves the body, the powers of the evil inclination set out to chase the soul in order to harm it. This is because the evil inclination is also the accusing angel. After taking the soul from the body, it pursues it in order to harm it and take vengeance on it. As the sages have said, the evil inclination, Yitzhahara, the angel of death, the Malahamavas, and the accusing angel, the Satan, are all one. Now, I know for a lot of people listening to this, this may be uh, new to you, so let me just tell you, there is a science a, to everything in the universe, and including to the soul and the nature of the soul and the afterlife and the process in which the, the soul, what we're, what we're up to, what's going on, the energies that are within us, and we all could learn about it. And here's the deal, the short end of it. We all are capable of bringing a tremendous energy into the environment that we're in. And that's a very good and beautiful thing. But that could go either way. And when it goes a negative way, it has repercussions to it. What drives us to do it the negative way? There's something called the evil inclination. So it drives us to do that which is not aligned with our neshama. And then here's what that result just tells us. That same force of the Satan or the Satan or you ever want to call that demonic force that has held us back from being able to accomplish what we're here for is the same force that comes to take our life from us. And it's the same force that actually comes to testify about us. Okay? So he overtook them while they were uh, camping by the sea. The sea 
to Purgatory Gehenim, known as the River of Fire. Okay, these are the words of the Ariza. Again, there's a lot to be explained over here, and don't let this be something that scares you. Judaism and spirituality should not be driven by one's fear. So it's really important that when you hear these words, you got to put it in context of a much bigger conversation. But understand there's, there's factual information that we are very aware of, and that's a longer conversation how, but this is the gift that the Arizal has given us is access to this information. So going back to the verse, he overtook them while they were camping by the sea. The sea refers to purgatory, Gehenim, known as the river of fire. Those are the words of the Arizal. The Moshe chimes in. When the soul leaves the body, it must first be purged of the existential crust of materialism and negativity it acquired during its stay in the physical world. Only then can it proceed to experience the pure spirituality of paradise. Now, so I just want to tell you that this is not to be seen as a punishment, but rather as a process. So think about if a person gets very, very, very dirty with a substance that's very difficult to take off their skin, then that person usually would have to go through a very difficult process to take that off their skin. So just like there's a nature to things in the physical world that sometimes have those type of repercussions, the same is also true about the spiritual journey that we're on. And there's repercussions into the journey that could cause, as we just now have spoken, where the soul has to go through a painful experience before it's able to ascend. And thank God that doesn't last more than 11 months, uh, which is why the 11 months of the Kaddish. <sighs> anyway, let's get back to our subject matter. He overtook them while they were camping by the sea. The sea refers to purgatory, purgatory Gehenna, known as the river. Okay, that we did. Let's go further. As Pharaoh drew near to give the soul over to the agents of damage and inflictions of pain and to torture them, the children of Israel raised their eyes and caught the sight of the Egyptians advancing at their rear, and they became very frightened. So the children of Israel cried out to Hashem. So Moshe explains, in order for the soul to be purified of this of its worldly material crust, it must first be made to experience the extent to which this materialism is antithetical to the truth and spirituality, to truth and spirituality. This is an agonizing, torturous awakening. All right, so let's, uh, you know, some things <laughs> could only really be shared in a nigan, in a tune. But the Alter Rebbe talks of the, the, about this idea. The first Chabad Rebbe talks about it in the Siddur and basically speaks about the fact that with, when a person leaves this world and they haven't really made that alignment before their passing, so then there's a journey that begins with the fact that because the perspective of which they were in and which they left was so within that realm of materialism, it has a painful journey to be able to become aware. What I mean, a painful journey, just imagine when a person has a really huge, 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 huge ego. They think they're, you know, whatever they think they are. Then they get to a place of truth where they're exposed, you know. So that is a very humiliating experience. But why is it a humiliating experience? It's humiliating because a person has allowed their ego to get so out of whack. So the pain is actually that which was produced by the person in that sense, you know? So use that metaphorically also, and we have to think about the journey that we're on, right? So now, what the Arizal is saying is this is the spiritual journey of the soul when a person is not in that alignment that we talked about and has been stuck and uh, drawn into the, uh, the um, temporary nature of things and existence as opposed to the purpose and existence of who we really are, our neshama. So they said to Moshe, going back to the, the story, that means they said to the good inclination, was it for want of graves in its shrine that you sought us to die in the desert? It is now that this is what the Arizal is explaining. 
Now that you see all this pain and suffering, these powers of evil are inflicting upon me, this battering in the grave, which is what the Hebrew word of it is. Was it not enough pain that I had to be buried and suffer inside the body and constrictions of the physical world that I must now experience as well, the pain of this grave? This refers to how the soul is battered inside the grave. Quote, and I have taken, I have been taken to die again in the desert, unquote, that is in purgatory, the desolate abode of the forces of evil. Here is where the vengeance is extracted from the soul. I know this is a very, very difficult to listen to. And this is not meant to scare again. I just want to re reiterate that. But, it's, it's, but it is good for us to get present to the truth of the system of creation. Let's go back to Rabbi Moshe's words. The soul refers to its birth into a physical body as being buried inside a grave. Death is not seen as a cessation of existence, but rather as a descent from one spiritual level to a lower one. Is it enough, the soul complains, that I had to live a full life in this grave of the body? Why must I suffer further? The image of the soul being battered in the grave refers to how it is existentially, existentially shaken of its materialistic encrustation as above. So like we talked about before about the skin, using that as a metaphor. And by the way, this is why we do mitzvahs for people who passed away. Because if a person's stuck, one of the things that could be done for them is when we do mitzvahs. And uh, when we do that, it, it helps them in the journey of being able to you know. Imagine, uh, you know, today they have uh, tattoos. They have easier ways of taking tattoos out of people's bodies. But once upon a time, it was very, very painful to do it. So imagine, you know, a person, because some, somebody did a mitzvah for them, they find out in heaven how to get rid of the tattoo in a quicker way. You know what I mean? So how to get whatever, whatever that is that's holding them back and, and keeping them stuck in a, in a quicker way. All right, back to our conversation. What is this that you have done to us, taking us out of Egypt? This is what the Arizal, going back to the Arizal station. Is this not the very thing we spoke of you about in Egypt saying, leave us alone and let us serve the Egyptians for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than die in the desert. That is, that's from the, that's what they quote in the Torah. So now the, the uh, Rizal is saying, quote, it was better for me in the body. I may as well have submitted to the evil inclination of the physical world. At least then I would not be suffering the pain I'm suffering now. In other words, by being shown the truth this is Rabbi Moshe's words. That being shown the truth and the splendor of spirituality, the soul is rudely awakened to the triviality of all things the body convinced it to be important in this world. This realization of the fruitility and emptiness of the material life of the physical world is more painful than any pain that can be experienced in the physical world itself. Wow. Think about that, you know, how often people get so stuck in their things, not realizing what they're inflicting on themselves without realizing, wow. That's all we need Mashiach now. <laughs> we need Mashiach now. He's <laughs> like, come on, how's this, you know, how, how, are, how are people, what? Hashem, we need Mashiach. That's the bottom line. All right. By being shown the truth and the splendor of spirituality, the soul is rudely awakened to the other way to that. The opposite is true, the tzaddik. He yearns for death from this world in order to go on to live in the world of truth. As the sages say, against your will you were born and against your will you live. But Moses said to the people, have no fear. Moses is a good inclination in this narrative. So Moses, the good inclination, tells the Jewish people, tells the soul, have no fear of this punishment, for it is for your own good. Through it, you will be rid of these inflictions of pain and be spared the ordeal of purgatory. All the powers of impurity will remain there in the sea that is the river of fire. Remember, that's what I was sharing with you about the 11 months. That's why for sure by 12 months, that's when it's done. 
after if there if a person has to go through this. Stand firm and witness the deliverance that Hashem will perform for you today. By means of the purification process of purgatory, you will be cleansed of your sins. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see again, for they will remain in, in purgatory. That means those negative forces and energy. Toward the end of the night, Hashem looked down upon the camp of the Egyptians with the pillar of fire and the cloud. This refers to the descent of the soul to be judged in purgatory when this is over. He threw the camp of the Egyptians into confusion. This refers to the powers of the evil inclination who are cast into the sea where they remain. But the Israelites had walked on the dry land in the midst of the sea while the water formed a wall for them on their right and on their left. The word for wall is homo, which is written the same as the word for anger, chema. The powers of evil are angry as the soul departs purgatory purified of its material dross. Now, when you say that, when we say that, just you understand, we're talking about a system. You know, when you look at the stories of science fiction, they base it off of this type of stuff, you know? So uh, it's uh, just so you know. All right. <clears throat> Moses then caused the Israelites to set out from the Sea of Reeds, and they went out into the desert ashore. They walked for three days in the desert without finding any water. They came to Mara, but they could not drink water at Mara, for the waters were was bitter. That was why the place was named Mara, bitter. After the soul departs purgatory, it starves for three days, since it depends three days without. It spends three days without learning Torah. Torah is the nourishment of the soul, enabling it to endure purgatory before entering paradise. The people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? That is, since we have not learned any Torah, the Torah is a tree of life to those who hold fast to it. God showed Moses a tree. He threw it into the water. The water became sweet. It was there that he gave the people the statue and law. And there he tested them. That is, a good inclination shows the soul the reward awaiting it in the world to come. The idiom statue, this is from Ramosha, also means provision. The word for tested also means lifted up. As it is about to enter paradise, Hashem prepares the soul by telling it that it is about to experience the true value of the mitzvahs that performed while it was in the body. This sweetens the water of the Torah, which it may have experienced as bitter deprivation in the physical world. Beautiful. Going back to the uh, teachings of the Arizal, he said, if you diligently heed the voice of Hashem, your God, and do what is upright in his eyes, carefully listening to all his commandments and observing all his statues, and none of the sickness that I brought on Mitzrayim and Egypt will I bring upon you, for I am Hashem who heals you. That is, the Arizal says, Hashem promises the soul. But since it observed the Torah during its lifetime in the physical world and underwent its purification process in purgatory, it will no longer experience any of the negativity and depression of evil, for it has been cured of all these. In other words, the future tense of the verse should be read as the past, since you diligently hated the voice, etc. By the way, just to give comfort to those who say, well, what about a person who didn't, you know, didn't be follow Torah? First of all, we don't know because... You know, all souls that are here today, I should say almost all souls for sure, uh, are souls that have never been here, and have been here many, many times before, so we don't know what a soul did in the previous lifetime, etc. They came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water and 70 date palms, and they encamped by the water. There are 12 rivers of pure spiritual water surrounding paradise, corresponding to the 12 tribes of Israel. Every soul of each tribe immerses in its respective river in order to be cooled from the fire of purgatory and healed of its wounds. Boy, I'm going to have to go for a run after this one. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Let's continue. So, you know, it's, uh, it's not easy to hear the truth, but we have to hear it. Because uh, then we can respond to it and we can do something about it. Okay, so here we go. God showed Moshe a tree. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. It was there that we gave the people. So that we did already. Sorry. Uh, here we go. Uh, that is, after this, there's one more stage before the soul enters paradise. It immerses again to be judged in the flame of the revolving sword, referred to here as the desert of sin. 
when Adam and Chava were banished from paradise, this is Zerubosh's words, God placed the flame of the revolving sword at the entrance to guard it. Now, so now you know where those science fiction movies get this stuff from. They get it from the teachings of Kabbalah. The purifying fire is as much more is a much more subtle one than that of purgatory, and it's necessary in order to remove it. The subtle materialism that still remains after the preliminary purification accomplished there. This may be compared to the two stages of circumcision after removing the thick foreskin. The thin mucous membrane must be peeled back as well. By the way, in gold also, and in whenever you have any purification process, we all know about that. There are different levels. It's 14, 18, etc. carats. Anyway, so that in order for it to be a pure, it goes through a, a more rigorous process. That's the idea. Neglecting to do this invalidates the circumcision. Similarly, in the circumcision of the heart, there are two stages as well. The, uh, the, the more apparent stage of the circumcision of the heart is the person's apparent ego. And then the less apparent stage is, of course, the subtle ego. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died in the hand of Hashem in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, but you have taken us out of this desert to starve this entire congregation to death. So now the Ariza goes back and says, what well, this is what they're saying in this context. The soul complains about this more subtle punishment as well, but it undergoes it when it passes the stage and wants to enter paradise. Hashem tells it, I am going to rain down bread for you from the sky. That is, here in paradise, you will eat a lot of the bread of the Torah that you studied while you were in that world. This Torah is the nourishment of the soul. It is the 248 limbs and 365 sinews of the soul, which are the 613 mitzvahs that form the soul's garment. The Torah itself, as distinct from the mitzvahs, is the soul's nourishment. If someone did not occupy himself with the study of Torah day and night in the physical world, he has nothing to eat in the physical, in, this, in the world of the souls, even though he may have something to wear formed by the mitzvahs he performed. People will go out. By the way, again, when we study Torah in the memory of somebody who passed, we're giving them food. So you're sending them a, you're sending them a meal. Send them a meal. The people will go out and gather each day's portion. In paradise, the souls collect its daily reward and nourishment. The entire community of the Israelites moved on from the desert of sin. The journey is according to the word of Hashem. That is, after re- receiving its reward in the lower level of paradise, the soul goes on to the upper level of paradise, referred to as Sinai, in order to receive new levels of the Torah from the mouth of Hashem. The letter Yud is added to the sin to give the word Sinai. They encamped in Rephidim, but there, there was no water from the people to drink. Amalek then came and fought against Israel and Rephidim. So the Ariza goes back and says, but before it ascends to the upper level of paradise, there's another type of purgatory, more subtle than the river of fire, that it must traverse, must traverse in order to burn away those sins of the righteous that are as tenuous as a thread of hair. The gross sins have already been rectified by the lower purgatory. Oh my gosh. Uh, good news is if we do tshuva like this, we, if we we return, we we really really return, then 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 we'll be okay. By the way, if you if you make your life about doing good mitzvahs and good good deeds for other people, you get to skip this all. Just so you know, I heard that story. Look it up yourself from the Baal Shem Tov called um, uh, the Baal Shem Tov called. Um, I got distracted anyway. Uh, Called a Herschel goat. That's the story. Okay. Anyway, back to our conversation. This is why Hashem judges the righteous to the breadth of the string of the hair. Their higher standard of being makes attitudes or actions that would be normally considered innocuous or even meritorious look depraved in the context of their lives. By the way, I'll tell you, I don't know if I told this story. I don't think I told you. You probably didn't hear this one. I'll tell it to you in short. I just heard it. A uh, recording from Rabbi Yosef Weinberg Allah Vasham, uh, he in his recordings of the previous Rebbe. And one of the stories he told over, or the different Chabad Rebbe's, one of the stories he told over was there was a certain, I think it was Pinchas Karitza, who got very, very, very ill. Why did he? So the Magid, who was his teacher, the student of the Baal Shem Tov, he gathered all of his students together and he said they have to come up with a good reason of why Pinchas should live. What was the problem? The problem was Pinchas had an idea in Torah that was so unbelievably over the top, and for a split second, he 
he felt proud about it because he's such a big tzaddik. You're not supposed to feel proud about your assertions of Torah. It's supposed to be an egoless experience. So therefore, unfortunately, he was judged to death. And now the different students were trying to give heavenly reasons. Like, imagine as if the heavenly court, which is the way that the Magad painted it, they're, they're, they're waiting to hear someone come up with a good reason why you should have First, Kabar Rebbe stood up and said, the Talmud says that when a person is close to death, it's as if they have died. So since he may have been punishable by death, but it's as if he has died, so now he, but he still could, according to nature, come back to life. So they should give him his life back. And that was something that was accepted in the heavenly court. And he came back and he lived for several years afterwards. But that's just an idea, talking about what we're talking about here, about you know the very righteous ones, the degree in which their accountability and just think about that because I, you know, I, there are people in the world that people call them all different types of terminologies for righteous, but every one of them that I've experienced has some dark closets and that's not for now. But you know, when you talk about, the, just think about the, in contrast to the people that live with this type of refinement in their life. This higher purgatory is called refidim, which alludes to the righteous, those who hands grasp of commandments was weak. According to Talmud, the implication of the name Rafidim is that there, the Jews loosened their hand grip on the Torah study, a story, a study of Torah. For the word Rafidim is derived from the word Rafa, which means loose or, loose or weak. This means that in Rafidim, the Jews did not perform Hashem's commandments properly, but in laziness and unwillingly. Similarly here, the soul has already gained entrance to the lower level of paradise, but in order to enter the upper paradise, it must have performed mitzvahs in the physical world with love, in love, with great desire and will. It receives its punishment for not having done this in this upper purgatory, which is synonymous with Amalek, the highest level of impurity, the subtle fire that is turning, I don't know what that word is, at war with Israel. Thus, sorry, uh, Rav Moshe, I needed your help on the pronouncing of that one. Uh, thus, Amalek then came and fought against Israel and Rafidim, which means because of Rafidim, so like uh, 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 Rav Moshe was saying, Amalek is synonymous with uninspired, unenthusiastic performance of Hashem's commandments, as it is written, Amalek, who pulled you off on your way to receive the Torah. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. You now know the spiritual understanding of how the whole gig works in terms of the uh, neshama and the ass life. Here's the great news. Number one, make your life about doing good deeds and helping other people. And then that's a good, good way to stay in, in, in the light. And number two, any second now, Mashiach is here and we won't have to be going through these experiences anymore once that happens as will be discussed at a different time where you can look it up as it's explained in many places. God bless you. Thank you for joining.